Welcome to Tales of History and Imagination, Eccentric Tales from History by Simone Whitlow. Today we join our tale right at its conclusion. The year 63 BC. The setting, the Kingdom of Pontus, a once powerful Black Sea Empire, now a region of eastern Turkey. Mithridates VI, Eupator, paces the floor, if you'll pardon my self-plagiarism, like a caged Barbary lion. Like Hannibal, Mithridates spent decades of war with Rome. Roman imperialism was the great evil of his time, an evil which must be stopped, whatever the cost. Now admittedly, nothing regarding Mithridates is ever cut and dried. The renowned freedom fighter was also a genocidal despot, a paranoid megalomaniac raised to believe a series of comets and other omens marked him out as a messiah. Legitimately tracing his lineage back to both Alexander the Great and Persian King of Kings, Cyrus the Great, he worshipped these men. He wanted nothing more than to emulate their conquests. Mithridates grew up reading all manner of legendary figures, not just some mythical tales of Amazonians, the Golden Fleece, and Prometheus as punishment for bringing fire to earth, all of which allegedly happened in his own backyard. He idolized real figures, like Antiochus III of Syria, Atlas, the poison king of Pergamon, Aristonicus, the rebel leader of the Citizens of the Sun, who carried out a years-long guerrilla war with Rome. He recalled Jugurtha, the Berber king of Numidia, who fought Rome but was defeated and paraded in chains before thousands of jeering Romans. Unquestionably, he knew of Hannibal, who proved Rome could be beaten, but ultimately ended up in a room much like this, pacing, contemplating a poison vial, as he too now was. Mithridates, it has to be said, was no Hannibal. For one, he brought this on himself. Roman general Pompey the Great marched into Asia to finish him, but judging him, if not dead, and certainly a spent force, left to conquer the Levant. Mithridates was free and clear so long as he kept out of Rome's way. His own people, in the city of Panticopion, were the ones surrounding him, baying for his blood. They refused to send more loved ones off to die in wars. His latest plan, to cross the Italian Alps like Hannibal, was the final straw. By day's end, his son Pharnaces would be king. Accompanied by his two youngest daughters and bodyguard, Mithridates gave a sip of fast-acting poison to each of the girls, then took the rest himself. And then, well, we'll come back to that. Mithridates was born 135 BC in Sinope, a wealthy port city on the edge of the Black Sea. Legend has it his birth coincided with a particularly bright comet passing through the sky, something many augurers read as an omen the child would become a great conqueror. He received the kind of classical education reserved for the wealthy, and showed a talent for botany and languages. He was also a gifted athlete with a love of high-risk pursuits. In his teens, his father, Mithridates V, died suddenly at a state banquet, Many suspected his mother, Laodice, of poisoning the king. The newly crowned Mithridates VI worried he'd meet the same fate as his father, so he ran away into the forests. Accompanied by an entourage, he travelled the length of his kingdom, meeting all the chieftains, the movers and the shakers in his land. Many nights they slept under the stars, and hunted for their meals. They also played the tourist, going to sites where Alexander or Xenophon, or mythic heroes like Hercules, did legendary things. Learning the lay of the land and of the myriad cultures of his polyglot kingdom, he was off on the original Grand Tour. At this time, Mithridates also became increasingly fixated on poisons and toxins. Pontus was full of things that could kill you, beyond his mother, and the obvious, like snakes and scorpions. Even the ducks and honey in parts of his land were toxic enough to put you in a coma. Fearful of dying as his father had, he began a years-long quest to develop an antidote to protect him from all poisons. At around 23 years of age, he returned to Sinope, 
In his absence, Laodicea had made an alliance with Rome, and was living a rather sumptuous lifestyle while the people struggled under heavy Roman taxation. In this time, Rome had alliances, or flat-out conquered several states in the Near East, making them the overlords of what was then considered Asia. The Romans heavily taxed many of these places, and with bureaucrats and soldiers came thousands of merchants looking for profit in the East. They were an insular lot, who thought themselves superior to the locals. They brought industrial levels of slavery with them. Many of the slaves former citizens of the very places the Romans settled in. Mithridates, who notoriously hated the Romans, caught the zeitgeist and swept back into power. In what started as a bloodless revolution, he took the reins and rescinded all agreements with Rome. He dealt with his father's alleged murderers, got rid of Roman taxes, and the people rejoiced. On the home front, he married his sister, something far more acceptable in those days, and they had a couple of kids together. They would fall out later after his wife, also named Laodicea, tried to kill him. Mithridates ordered her execution. In 88 BC, Mithridates masterminded an incident which altered the course of his life, and had the follow-through played out differently, would have changed world history to this day in ways we can only imagine. To this day, it stands as one of history's worst terrorist attacks. For months, Mithridates plotted with dozens of Near Eastern leaders to attack all Romans and other Italians in the region. Their attack would occur simultaneously, in dozens of cities, by thousands of locals. How he communicated with dozens of leaders is a mystery. Suggestions include envoys with the orders tattooed on the backs of their heads, hidden under their hair till they arrived, and instructions written on pig's bladders carefully stuck to the insides of vases. More remarkably, of the thousands involved, no one spilled the beans to Rome. On an unspecified date in May 88 BC, thousands of people from all walks of life took up arms and turned on Rome. In Pergamon, Rome's capital in Asia, Roman settlers fled to the temple of Asclepius. In many cities they fled to temples, believing the mobs would fear the wrath of the gods. Mobs burst into temples that day. In Pergamon, executing all up close and personal with bows and arrows. In Ephesus, Romans took refuge in the temple of Artemis. A similar scene played out. This time they were cut down with swords, knives and sundry other weapons. In Andromitian, they were forced into the sea and drowned. In Kaunas, the large slave population gathered the Romans around the statue of their god Vesta, then methodically slaughtered them, starting with children, moving to the women, then finally the men. In Tralles, a mercantile town, local leaders didn't want to get their hands dirty. They hired a Paphlagonian mercenary named Theophilus and his gang to do the hit. They rode into town looking something like a biker gang, herded the Romans into a temple, then painted the walls with their blood. And on it went, genocidal acts in dozens of towns and cities, aided by local hatred for Rome. Somewhere in the order of 80,000 Romans were murdered that day. Initially, things looked great for Mithridates. The massacre sparked an economic depression in Italy. Rome, already fighting the social war with several Italian states, broke into a civil war proper as the consul Lucius Cornelius Sulla made a play for dictator. The path was clear for Mithridates to take over all of Asia Minor. From there, he would expel Rome from Greece. His army swept through the Turkish kingdoms of Bithynia, Phrygia, Ionia, Mysia, Lycia, Cappadocia. Many Greek city-states welcomed him when he arrived as a liberator and flocked to his side to help. Athens threw off the Roman yoke of oppression, led by the philosopher Athenian. Rome couldn't retaliate. They already had too much going on, and for a while Mithridates looked unstoppable. Rhodes was the first stumbling block. In the wake of Alexander the Great's passing, the island nation became a respected military and trading power. In 305 BC, they proved their toughness after Macedonia laid siege to the island. Rhodes hung in there as the Macedonians hit them with massive siege engines, 
180 foot long battering rams, you name it. Macedonia finally gave up, abandoning weapons and siege engines. Rhodes sold the abandoned gear for scrap, making enough to construct the Statue of Liberty sized Colossus of Rhodes with the proceeds. When Mithridates besieged Rhodes in 88 BC, the Colossus was long gone. It fell into the sea after an earthquake in the 260s BC. Rhodes' tenacity, however, remained in spades. Mithridates landed in the first wave, tasked with taking out the smaller towns and setting up a base. The people of Rhodes were all safely behind the capital's defensive walls. The towns outside the walls raised, the fields cleared. With no home base and only the supplies brought with them, they hunkered down and waited for the rest of the army to arrive. Very few of them would actually make it to Rhodes. First, his navy was caught in a violent storm, and several ships were lost. Next, Rhodes sent out their admiral, Demagoras, with a small but experienced fleet of much quicker biremes. They sunk several more Pontic vessels before departing. Next, Mithridates' army ruined their assault on the city. The plan was a group sent into the hills to look for the navy would light a signal fire from a hilltop when it was time to attack. Rhodes caught wind of this and lit a fire of their own. An ill-prepared army charged early and were mown down. Then there was a Sambuca. A Sambuca is a large ramp, usually sailed up to defensive walls on the front of a ship, then lowered onto the wall. Soldiers then run up that ramp at the enemy. Mithridates' Sambuca was an unwieldy contraption with catapults at the base. It was so big it needed two ships to carry it. It collapsed under its own weight, taking the ships with it. Unceremoniously defeated, Mithridates turned tail and sailed for Pontus. This incident set the tone for much of the Mithridatic Wars. While he commanded much larger armies, leadership was poor. They trapped themselves in indefensible places. They fought like 4th century BC Greek hoplites, while 1st century BC wars were best fought like Roman legions. Rome, in the meantime, regained their footing under Sulla, who funded an expedition by raiding first Roman, then Greek temples. Greece fell to Sulla in 86 BC, following the battles of Chironia and Orchomenus. The Treaty of Dardanus was verbally agreed to in 85 BC. Mithridates handed all his conquests back to Rome. He gave up much of his navy to Rome and incurred a massive fine. A second Mithridatic war soon followed. Lucius Licinus Marina, tasked with re-establishing Rome's Asian territories, started a war with Pontus in 83 BC. Mithridates was far better prepared this time, and the war ended inconclusively. Mithridates had learned a lot from this first war. He also made a powerful ally in his new son-in-law, Tigranes the Great, King of Armenia. We'll come to that third and final war in a moment. Let's talk about peace and the home front. In peacetime, the court of Mithridates was abundant in all things. On any given night, there was a great feast. The entertainment could be anything from Greek plays to sporting events to the hottest bands from anywhere in the empire. Drinking and eating contests were frequent. Ancient sources tell us nobody could outdrink or outeat Mithridates. The king was in the midst of the merriment, often surrounded by his harem of beautiful women from across the kingdom. There was often a point in the evening, though, where the feast took a darker turn. Some unlucky prisoner would be brought forth and forced to drink poison. All would look on as the human guinea pig died. Mithridates would then perform his party trick. A servant would pour him a glass of the same poison, and he would gleefully imbibe. Legend has it his years of paranoia that he'd meet the same fate as his father, bore fruit. Over years of trial and error, Having poisoned a great many criminals and prisoners of war, the King of Kings, the Poison King, had developed an antidote to most poisons. Every day the King took a vial of his Mithridatium to fend off the poisoners. Though the recipe is now lost, some believe the Romans did get their hands on it and several emperors took it daily. Theriac, a Greek supposed panacea, which remained popular till the 19th century, may well have been Mithridatium. If there is anything that most people may know about Mithridates, it is Mithridatium. The British poet A.E. Houseman writing in his epic poem, A Shropshire Lad. 
There was a king reigned in the east. There, when kings will sit to feast, they get their full before they think, with poison meat and poison drink. He gathered all its springs to birth from the many venomed earth. First a little, thence to more, he sampled all a killing store. An easy, smiling, seasoned sound. Sate the king when healths went round. They put arsenic in his meat, and stared aghast to watch him eat. They poured strychnine in his cup, and shook to see him drink it up. They shook, they stared as white as his shirt. Them it was, the poison hurt. I tell the tale that I heard told. Mithridates, he died old. Now, back to the Mithridatic Wars. I couldn't hope to cover all of this in detail in the confines of a 20-minute episode. But here's the main points. One thread that runs through all of Mithridates' wars is his belief he should be overlord of a neighbouring kingdom of Bithynia. Mithridates was once an ally to their king, Nicomedes III. They fell out. After the first Mithridatic War, Bithynia was handed back to Rome's puppet king, Nicomedes IV, who died in 74 BC, leaving Bithynia to the Romans. Rome was tied up with an uprising in Spain, led by the rogue general Quintus Sertorius. This was all Mithridates needed to march an army into Bithynia and reclaim the land. To add to the chaos, a Thracian slave called Spartacus led an uprising in Italy itself at around the same time. As often the case, the war played well for Mithridates, till Rome could afford to give him their full attention. Then it turned ugly very quickly. Several nations, including his allies Armenia, were drawn into the Third Mithridatic War. When the war began, Mithridates was in command of an army of 300,000 soldiers. The Roman generals were far too good for his army, however, and he would conclude with a band of a few thousand guerrilla fighters engaged in a hit-and-run surprise attacks on Rome. Tigranes Empire would be brought to heel by Rome for their part in the war. Hundreds of thousands of people would die. The Roman general Lucullus had control of Pontus, then lost control in 67 BC following the Battle of Zela. Rome responded by sending in Pompey the Great, fresh from victories against Sertorius in Spain and unfairly claiming victory over Spartacus, as well as cleaning up the growing piracy problem in the Mediterranean. Pompey proved way too much for Mithridates. Soon all the poison king had was a small band of fighters, including his new partner, a real-life Amazonian, a Scythian warrior named Hypsicrataea in the tiny kingdom of the Bosphorus, modern-day Crimea. In 66 BC, Pompey pursued Mithridates to the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains, not expecting a man now in his late 60s to be capable of crossing the Caucasus. Pompey had a handful of ships cruising the edge of the Black Sea for the group. He then took his army to the Levant to conquer new lands, but survive he did. He crossed through the Scythian keyhole, through barbaric lands, and marched into Panticopion. Unlike Hannibal, he could have lived the rest of his life in peace. But in 63 BC, Mithridates started to plot another invasion. This time he'd assemble another army of tens of thousands of locals. They would march to the river Danube, then follow it down to the Italian Alps. Little did he know people would riot. He'd be copying Hannibal in a completely different way. To bring our tale full circle... Mithridates is in the tower. His daughters have passed on. Mithridates, on the other hand, paces the room. In the hope an increased heart rate will speed up the poison. He paces the room, sweaty, clammy, a little woozy, but it appears impervious to whatever toxin is racing through his system, be it arsenic, hellebore, hemlock, belladonna, or the toxic ducts of the Black Sea. Out of options, Mithridates turns to his bodyguard, Pituitus and begs to be put to the sword. Sometimes a tale concludes I've got a bit of an insight, some moral. I'm not sure I really do here. Don't mess with Imperial Rome? Well, it goes without saying, but I think a lot of so-called barbarian people were morally right to resist. Though they lacked in firepower expertise, it was still the right thing to do. If I had a full hour to tell this story, then maybe it's all about many, many omens on the way. Comets and various other things that happen that more and more makes a solipsistic man think that he really is going to be some kind of great conqueror and um, godlike. Maybe it's a tale of obsession. 
Mephrodite's obsessive drive to be like his mightier ancestors, combined with an obsessive hatred of Rome, led to genocide, led to a series of wars costing hundreds of thousands of lives. He lost everyone he loved. Obsession destroyed a great empire, only not the one he expected it to. Likewise, his obsession to not die as his father had, ultimately worked only too well. 